Hey, everybody. I'm finally going to take a moment to go through how to do one of these drawings. So this over here is an example of kind of our finished product we're shooting for here. And I thought I'd just walk you through the step-by-step -step process of how I get there. This might not be quite as fancy as that one, but we'll see. So I've got my setup here, which is just uh, a, a flat piece of watercolor paper that I have taped down. Uh, and we'll see that those edges are there for a reason. And I have some sort of a stone object here. Here's actually one that I have drawn and painted before. I have a short about this, although I'm going to do the other side of it. Last time we did this side, we're going to do this side this time. You actually get a totally different drawing if you just flip the object over because every, every biface is unique and has uh, unique, uh, interesting flakes and curvatures. So in terms of tools, what I've got here is a really simple artist pencil uh, of a pretty, pretty firm um, density. This is an H density, which is, you know, pretty hard, almost like a, like an engineer's pencil. That's just what I prefer myself for our underdrawing. And then for inking, I have just two uh, thicknesses of inking pens, a 0.5 and a 0.8, which is what I've been preferring. And then uh, a set of uh, round paint brushes here for the watercolor at the end um, in some different sizes, but all the same type of paintbrush. And uh, we'll, we'll get going from there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to sort of cite this. Now, there is a technical approach to drawing these sorts of stone tools uh, that is in some ways what I'm mimicking. Um, but um, this, uh, I haven't been doing that for these for these more artistic drawings. Now, honestly, for uh, if I was doing this as a scientific approach, you would take really uh, measurements. I have uh, calipers and and, uh, and, a, and a artist triangle and all those sorts of things. And you take very precise measurements of exactly where the flakes are because that's the point of a scientific illustration uh, is to is to uh, copy something quite precisely. This is not a scientific uh, a scientific piece that we're making here. Instead, we're doing. Um, we're doing a, a something more artistic approach. Uh, and so I'm going to eyeball this instead. And I want to roughly multiply the size of this tool by about 0.5. So we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to eyeball the edges. So this, this part just takes, since we're eyeballing, this part really just takes practice. And it's just like drawing anything else where uh, I'm going to end up with a rough shape that might not be precisely perfectly accurate and we'll tweak uh, and we'll fix as we go. But we just want to get our edges in here. We want to get our outline in here with the rough notion of where the major flakes are going to be. We'll notice that this comes down to a sort of a, oh, I've gone just a bit too far there. So there's our first, there's our first correction. And So, and then we have a kind of a, which is going to be sort of important, a little bit of a three-dimensional shape, right? All right, so I'm, I'm actually fairly okay with that edge. That's going to get refined as we go. And the next step is to try and find our flake scars. We're going to move through this pretty quickly. I don't want to spend all day on this. You certainly can. Um, but we want to try and find our flake scars. So... Normally, again, if we were doing this quite precisely, I would measure these and I'd put little markings in where all of our flakes are. We're going to, again, sort of eyeball this a bit more since this is a bit more just an artistic piece. This object, by the way, that I'm drawing is not a real artifact. It is a modern, uh, a modern piece made by a flint napper, a student of mine, actually, named Anthony Gambardello, who's very, who's a very talented flint napper. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll link to his, uh, I'll link to his, uh, to his YouTube channel, which is just him doing some flint napping stuff in the, uh, comments or in the, not, excuse me, on the comments in the description of this. If you want to give him a follow and take a look at that, he does some really cool stuff there. And I think the channel is just very young and just him sort of playing around a little bit, but I think he wants to put more stuff up there. So this is, this is just a simple sort of utilized tool. He also makes beautiful points and, and, and things like that. But actually these, these utilized flakes make great subjects for, uh, drawings like this one because, uh, because, um, uh, they have, they have, they have quite large, nice, big, large flakes, which are fun to draw, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and kind of interesting to, 
to actually get to this has some interesting uh, surface depth, which is kind of neat. So you can see I'm just kind of trying to move through the point and find these flakes. This takes a bit of an eye. It takes some practice to get used to. And there's an interesting, yeah, this has some cool, some cool kind of a, one thing that you want, you want to give your edge, don't treat your edge of the tool, if you're going to try and draw some of these, as a flat surface. It's actually made up of these little, uh, these little plates that are the flakes themselves. And, um, and so you want to try and capture that as best you can. So you can see here, like I'm going to give, I'm going to give each of these flakes is going to have its own sort of profile on the edge uh, so that it looks like the flakes kind of come together to make the edge instead of it having a flat surface just with sort of drawings jutting in from there. So see how I've done that there. And there's actually little, there's some little micro flakes here. I have a tendency to sort of jump around the tool when I'm doing this. I think probably other better artists than me would do this a bit more systematically, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's okay. This kind of actually comes in a little bit here. And there's a quite abrupt flake here. You know, this is some, some interesting, weird, some weird ones. Some kind of internal flakes there. So I might occasionally go a little bit quiet on here as I just concentrate and also this is a very relaxing form of art to do i would say it's very low stakes this is actually the inside of a huge internal flake here that kind of goes like this actually comes down like that now oh, there's a lot going on here this is all this needs to come in a little bit more This is actually all one huge flake that sort of oh yeah this is all kinds of interesting interlocking interlocking flakes this is a tricky this is a tricky piece in sort of a satisfying way You can hear my rambunctious kids in the background from time to time. Uh, it's just a lazy Saturday morning, and they're just hanging out and doing some doing some art. This is this is what I do to relax these days. <laughs> is uh, actually both of these activities, both doing a little stone tool illustration or just illustration drawing in general, and um, and also making videos for you know, both of those things. I find quite relaxing and. They're my hobbies these days. Um, this actually. All right, let's see. And, you know, that's a couple of, a uh, couple of small internal flakes here, but that's, that's sort of it. So we have our kind of our outline here. I'm going to keep it kind of simple. And again, not a huge number of flakes in this piece. Next comes the kind of, I would say, the tricky part, which is our curvature lines. So this is what makes this illustration technique different from others. And um, um, it's how we represent three dimensions in these flakes. So we want to create these gentle curvature lines. And again, there's a sort of a practice to this, but you want to try and match the curvature of the flake going either direction. One, one trick you can do is you can actually draw to get an idea for how this works. You can draw straight across and then erase the middle. You want it to meet up evenly on the other side, even, um, even though there's a kind of a blank space in between. And you're going to kind of feather your arc um, as you move across the, across the flake, you can tell I'm no, I'm no art, I'm no art teacher, uh, but I, I do, I do my best. These are all, of course, going to get 
inked over anyway, but nonetheless, we want to try and do our best with them. And I want that to be a bit sharper of curvature. You want to try and get your curvatures right here, because obviously once you put the ink down, the situation becomes far more permanent. Actually, put these little internal flakes here that we can kind of... All right, now this, this guy is so big, it's flakes are really... Get a little, little touch of uh, ASMR maybe with the... Uh... Now you'll notice the flakes that, that begin on this right side of the face uh, have curvatures that move away, always moving away from the edge. So you see when we start to do this side, we'll see the curvatures are going to come the other direction. And if they actually, if the flakes come up from the base, if they're basal thinning flakes, then your curvature would run perpendicular. Uh, this doesn't actually really have anything like this. This is all worked bilaterally, this piece. So we don't have to worry about that so much. So we'll see, you know, how that kind of goes. Maybe with the exception, actually, of this, this little guy here. One exception. So you'll see now we're going to move on to these ones on this side of the face. And we'll see they... This very first one here needs to be a little... needs to be a tighter circle. Something I'm learning by doing is uh, the flakes should be... should actually kind of need to change with the face, with the angle of the face where so they don't look natural. So what I mean by that is that here towards the base of the flake where it was struck near the bulb of percussion, which we can actually see in this one, um, the curvature is, is tighter and then it gets wider as we move further away. And then actually looks quite nice like that. This flake also is going to have this sort of a this nice internal flake. All right, this guy here is, you know, again, this is, even though these flakes have been overstruck in interesting ways, they nonetheless are bilateral. This one here, yeah, this one here does actually kind of go against the grain, so this is going to be this kind of direction. Uh, all right, and that's it, right? That's step two. So now we have our underdrawing. And in many ways, that's actually the, that's the most time-consuming part. So I'm going to use these little inking pens now. And uh, this is a 0.8, which I'm going to use for all of my outside lines. And then, as we'll see in a minute, I'm going to switch to a 0.5 for just the curvature lines. So we'll get that bulb percussion in there. And some of those little... Then these little micro flakes make themselves known when we're doing this step. A little step there at the base of this. I'm sort of happy with how this, this is coming out okay. A little hair there. I think this is going to look nice. Okay, and you can see my sort of penchant for jumping around the tool a little bit and my rambunctious artistic spirit. I can't help it. Sometimes you can add a little uh, line weight when you've got these sort of internal fluctuations within the tool itself. Play around with line weight a little bit if you're the illustrator sort of a type.
which I'm not. I'm using big words to make it sound like I'm an artist, which I'm not. I just picked up this little hobby. I shouldn't say that. I'm, I'm cutting myself short. Of course, I've been been doing this sort of drawing and stuff for a couple of, well, maybe about 18 months now. And if you had asked me maybe 18 months ago, uh, I would have told you I can't, I can't draw a straight line, you know, connecting two dots, which was true at the time. And then I, I sort of picked up some more artistic hobbies and have been enjoying teaching myself to, to do this and also to, uh, and also to to do watercolors. Okay, we're done with that now. We're going to go to our point five, and this is where things get serious. Maybe a little, a little quieter through this section. This is the nerve-wracking section, if you will. This is where mistakes can happen. This is where problems will become apparent if we haven't done a good job on our on our underdrawing. So far I'm perfectly happy with how this is coming out. Though we'll see. Oh, that wasn't a great that one wasn't great. That's okay. Oh, I didn't like that curve. Again, recognizing that some of these are things I see that nobody else in the world would ever see and feel like, oh, I didn't do that curve just right. I don't, don't like how that looks. You know, we are by definitely our own worst critics when it comes to art. it helps if you can get two curved lines opposite each other like this see you can kind of go that and it creates that nice that can, that can add to that illusion of three-dimensionality which is obviously what we're going for here that's what we're trying to create and we're almost We're almost to the to the color phase. More than I missed. Now I've noticed different artists prefer different line weights here, different densities. I've been doing a kind of a quite light density here with these curvature lines. Some artists use very dense uh, line density here with the right there. They do these all the curvature lines very close together, and that can create really a lot of depth. I've been finding with the painting, I don't want quite that much depth. So now for the painting, just like with any watercolors, you can see my colors here and my little tool-wise, I have four different round brushes here of um, different sizes. All my paint colors are just some very simple watercolors um, and uh, a little canvas here so that I can see what these things look like. Now I'm painting very, if you guys can see this, I paint these very wet, so there's I have these kinds of pools of water here, and we're going to add, we're going to try and get our color that we want here. So we want to get this base red, and then the other color is almost a, just a true black, very simple. So this orangey red, so we can, I mean, we have a base orange here. That's not going to be the right kind of orange. That's going to be way too orange, but let's start with that. There's definitely some more brown in this too. Maybe this sort of a brown. Kind of a yellowy brown. Mm -hmm. We're just going to keep mixing colors until we get something that we like. And we can always throw it away if we don't. Oh, that's a little closer, isn't it? That's looking a bit more, a bit more right. So maybe a bit more of this. 
Um, mm, I like to put a little bit on the paper there. So that's a bit brighter than this, but it sort of might be okay. Let's add a tiny bit more brown. Oh, that's getting pretty close. Kind of a brownish orange. Maybe we'll stick with that because it's okay. The color does not does not have to be anywhere near perfect. Now, because this has got this cool speckling pattern. Now, I, I've tried in the past doing painting within the actual, just doing painting within the um, flakes, but... Uh, I actually think that often that creates um, the flakes start to look like they're not part of a cohesive whole. So I actually will now what I've been preferring to do is just putting down a wash over the whole thing, a base layer wash. In this case, we're going to kind of we're going to kind of speckle with the expectation that we're going to be mixing in our darker black color. And we can always add more layers later. This bottom here is significantly more of this black color. Right? And I'm not being super, again, I'm not going for precision here, I'm not going for an absolute perfect representation of the, of the, of the, the tool. Um, but rather, you know, this is an artistic, uh, interpretation. So we, we, we're not going to worry too much about getting these speckles precisely right, but we want to get at least sort of close. So now I need to kind of quickly, before this totally dries, make our other color here, which is obviously a quite simple black and maybe some gray mixed in. Um, and you know what? I'm actually going to take a tiny bit of the orange color and mix that in too. I'm just going to steal a little bit of that. But I want, again, I want to get this on the paper as quickly as I can before the uh, before the other color has a chance to dry because I want it to do some intermixing. I want it to kind of, I want the colors to flow into each other a tiny bit. That will create a, a more naturalistic effect. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is, this is looking just fine. Yeah, this is going to work. You can notice how fast those colors dry. They really do dry fast, which is what we want. I don't want to sit here for a half an hour waiting for this to dry while I'm trying to record this. We're doing it in one take. Using my most important tool, my raw, disgusting fingers. All right. Yeah, yeah, I keep overshooting a little bit. It's okay. Again, it gives it a little bit of a, yeah, we get some of these kind of like little, little imperfections, add character to the drawing. Now you can see that's a quite a flat, it's got a quite a flat look. We're going to add our depth in a moment. So we're gonna switch brushes. We're gonna go for something a tiny, uh, significantly uh, smaller. And we just wanna get darker versions of those two colors. And I'm gonna keep this real simple just by adding black to both of them. Now this is gonna be even blacker. And yeah, that's, 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 that looks good. And then we'll also add some black to our orange color, which we might actually end up using more. And that gives it almost a, almost a dark brown effect. And as bits of this start to dry, I can even help it along a little bit. I'm just gonna use my medium brush here, with just a tiny bit of moisture on it too. Blend some of these edges just a bit. I'm gonna fill in some holes that I'm noticing. You know, I don't know. I I I am not 
a painter and I am very stubborn and I sort of refuse to learn anything. Like I refuse to like even watch like a YouTube video that's like how to use watercolors. Everything I've done, I've just been just gotten from like pure experimentation, which tends to be the best way that I learn. It's my best learning technique. But nonetheless, it's it's stubbornness that leads to uh that leads to me uh, not um not getting as strong a work as I probably should. So I'm gonna go right ahead. This is gonna be like in full. I might even add some true black to that in a minute. But what we want to start doing as this dries a little bit is using our darker colors to put some shadowed edges in. We're gonna assume our light is coming from the upper left-hand corner here. So this is our light source. So we're gonna just gonna start to give some of these edges some depth. This is a little bit of a messier paint job than I've been doing lately, because I'm rushing a bit. But we should start to see some depth emerge. Sometimes it's okay to do this when it's still a bit wet because you get a kind of a cool effect. This is probably just a touch too wet. Hmm, yeah. I've no idea if that works or not. We're going to kind of just we can actually lift, if you do it quick enough, you can sort of lift some of that paint back up, which is nice. Watercolors are very unforgiving in some ways and very forgiving in others. It's kind of a neat, it's a neat medium. Mm. This isn't precisely behaving the way that I want it to. dog barking in the background. That's okay. Slice of life. That's way too much. What am I doing? Goodness gracious. Hmm. I might step away for a moment and just go let my dog in. So this is uh, this this section is uh, going slow, and this is the part I uh, don't pretend to fully understand, like why this works sometimes and why it doesn't. And there's always a period where I'm like, oh, this is this is not working at all, and what am I doing? And and uh, and then it, and then it usually you know sort of starts to come together eventually, for reasons that never become entirely clear to me. And I don't know if that's going to be true this time or not. Definitely going to be a messier piece than some of my others. That's okay. Sorry. Still kind of fun. Just trying to get this sense of so 
some sense of depth there. I want to kind of try and get the impression that things get darker as we move to the bottom of the tool and further from our light source. Yeah, I've got to just sort of come some places where this has gotten away from me a little bit. It's okay. This is not a perfect piece. It's just, it's still fun to make. song by Japanese Breakfast stuck in my head. Those worst fates. Well, you know what? We'll probably just stop. Stop poking at this now. Is it my best work? Absolutely not. Is it okay? Yes. Go ahead and just take all the moisture out of that. And then I do something different. This pure, unadulterated black right on there. And we're gonna stop there now. Hmm. Now, the last thing we do on these pieces. Thanks for hanging out with me so far, by the way. Hopefully this is at least somewhat pleasant. The last thing we're going to do is we're going to create an... We're going to create a border for this thing. This is where we can kind of have some fun. I'm thinking something in the... Something in a quite bright blue. Ooh, that's, that's sort of a pretty color. That's it's a bit more of a hmm. maybe a blue. You know what? Let's do something a little interesting. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little bit of a gradient in some colors from the other side of the color wheel from this particular cell. This is not complicated. I literally just just start just splotching down color here. And I want to go from my densest up at the left-hand corner, getting lighter as we move closer to the tool. And we'll bring our edges in here. As close as we can. You'll see what the tape is for in a minute. I have to try and create the effect that our that our our paint is. Uh, this this is an actual background. Which means you kind of bring it in as tight as you can, and make it look natural. And we're gonna, again, we're gonna sort of a base layer down. We want to really make it dense up here at the top. No, I just got, I just got a little wild there. We added some gray. And now I have actually a separate color, kind of a green slaty green down here at the bottom. We're going to just 
blend these into each other as best we can. Be a little bit careful because that paint down here is wet. Okay, we have to move kind of fast because we're trying to trying to get before these colors totally. Totally dry. We want to get them to mix. And we're just gonna add depth to this by sort of adding again quite wet color work. And we want we want it to sort of as much as possible gradient between the two. Just now that this has dried a bit, we can actually get a little bit more depth on them. Yeah, this is not, not my absolute best work, but it's okay. It's just for educational purposes, right? And really now, sort of before the tape has a total chance to dry, we probably normally want to let it dry a bit longer than this, but let's do it anyway. And we'll notice we get some pooling at the edges, which oftentimes will create some kind of fun. I like that green color. We'll create some neat effects where some of the paint, yeah, like that, will get a little bit under the tape. Uh, and that's it again. Not my best work, but it's a thing. It's it's a it's a tool. It's drawn. It looks kind of neat. And uh, you know, you can always continue touching up if you want. You know, you can always add a little bit more depth and just continue adding some some extra darks. You could even add some lights. I've, I've played with that too. Adding some 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 highlights in addition. I've just done this kind of in a monochrome with just the two, just dark and light. You can add lights too. And uh, that's the whole shebang.